This is ContactTalkRadio.com. Consciousness in action. And you are taking action into your consciousness by tuning into Contact Talk Radio. And on TuneIn.com, Ying.fm, and Upsnap Mobile. Contact Talk Radio. Coming live from Miami, Florida, it's time to get rid of the excuses and make room for the successes. Get unstuck with real stories of motivation and determination. So lace up your shoes, shoulders back, and head up and get ready to keep it moving with Ivan Hunt. Here's your host, Ivan. Hey, 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 it's me, your man, Ivan Hunt, coming live from Miami, Florida, but we're blasting worldwide on the CTR network. So if this is your first time listening to, you know, talk radio, Keep it moving. So what is Keep It Moving all about? It's all about inspiring, motivating, encouraging, and empowering people to take ownership over their life so they can regain control of their life, so they can live a life that's full of purpose, passion, and meaning. So as I do every show, I always start off with what I call Ivan's little chit-chat. Me and you are just going to have a chit-chat. So, you know, we're just going to have a small little chit-chat. So what's this chit-chat going to be about this week? So I did an AMA event on AMA Feed dot com called coaching AMA and AMA stands for ask me anything. And I got some really, really good questions, great questions. And, you know, I, I just want to share a little bit of those questions with you or a particular topic that kind of kept coming up. And hopefully you'll find it insightful. Hopefully you'll find value in it. And if you've gone through this particular situation, then maybe it'll bring a little bit of um, clarity for you. And, and understanding. So a lot of the questions that I got range from coaching. You know, what type of coaching do I do? How do they contact me? Um, some of it was, you know, how do you coach someone who uh, is kind of stagnant in life and, you know, they're scared to pursue certain things. But then some of there was some more in-depth questions. And the, the, the two questions that really kind of jumped out at me was around divorce. And how do you help prepare someone emotionally that's about to go through a divorce, they're in a divorce, or they've been divorced. And then the second question was, if you were running a a support group around divorce, how would you set up that support group? And what would be, you know, how can that support group best serve those individuals that are going through a divorce? So I started thinking about it because I'm divorced and I'm remarried. And happily remarried, I'll put that in there. And that's a cheap shot, but forgive me. But one of the hardest things I've ever gone through was the divorce. And it was a lot of different reasons on why that divorce was so hard and why I think divorce is very much similar, you you know, to death. And one of those things um, uh, that that comes, you know, comes to mind is, you know, death is a lot like uh, uh, or divorce or divorce is a lot like death, right? So one of the things that I offered as, as advice or tip is to really understand the grieving process, you, you know, the very stages of grieving because divorce is just that it's a change. It's a complete life altering change. Everything about a divorce challenges you, you, you know, all your hopes and dreams, you, you know, seem to get shattered, you, you know, sometimes overnight, Sometimes over a period of time, our core beliefs, you know, the things that we were taught growing up get shattered. You know, we're taught, hey, look, you're only supposed to have, you know, you get married and live happily ever after. But very rarely, and I won't say very rarely, but, you know, marriage is not a happily ever after thing. You know, happily ever after comes with a lot of heartache and pain and a lot of commitment and understanding and forgiveness and sacrifices and compromising. The challenge that I had with my divorce, I think, was, one, it was a very toxic relationship. And it was a very abusive relationship. So one question that I got was, was, you know, what was one of your biggest failures? And I didn't put this down because I, I don't really consider this a failure as much as I really kind of consider it a regret to some extent. You know, I regret being an abusive husband in my first marriage. Now, let me define abusive. Mental, emotional, verbal, and physical. So I was that guy, right? Now, I'm, I'm not going to try to throw her underneath the bus. 
I'm not going to bring up anything negative towards her. That has nothing to do. I'm not responsible for her actions. I'm only responsible for mine and how I responded to challenges in our marriage. And I didn't have the aptitude or the intellect to really process anger. And that anger a lot of times was displayed in very destructive ways, you, you know, destructive towards her mentally, emotionally, physically, and, and, and verbally. And it was something that I had to really learn how to forgive myself for. The, the divorce itself lasted, you know, the signing of the paper is, um, you know, a five minute event, you know, divorce, you know, the actual divorce is an event. The process of healing from a divorce, though, is just that. It's a process. I had to go through a period of really of reflection and understanding and trying to grasp what all had happened. You, you know, because, again, like I said, you know, I was taught that, you know, hey, you get married once and that's it. Well, that wasn't the case. All of a sudden, I found myself alone. All of a sudden, I found myself that disbelief that had been given to me was no longer applicable. It didn't apply. I no longer, you know, fit in that category or I could check off that box of only being married once. You know, now all of a sudden I'm checking off the box of being remarried. You know, and, and at first it was kind of devastating. It was like, whoa, wait a minute. You, you know, I, I'm supposed to be this guy that's only supposed to marry once, but all of a sudden now here I am faced with a divorce. And even the sadder part of that was that my kids, my two boys at the time, you know, they're still my two boys, but, you know, my boys saw me be physical in my first marriage. And, you know, and and I don't even think I really understood then the impact that that had on them. So my biggest regret probably was the, my boys seeing me be abusive in my first marriage. Now, after that marriage, I got into a subsequent, you know, rebound relationship which was probably just as toxic, if not more toxic in a lot of ways. I didn't know how to, I didn't know how to deal with silence. I didn't know how to deal with being alone after or during or during after the divorce in the process of the divorce. Um, it was hard. You, you know, it, it was, it was something that was really, really hard for me. You know, I prayed a lot. I cursed God a lot too, you know, um, I cursed the devil a lot and prayed to the devil a lot too. You know, I, I, I drank, I did drugs, you know, I, you know, try to consume my time with women and partying and all these other things, anything in the world other than dealing with me. And eventually it got to a point where I had to deal with me. Right. And it was during that time that, um, I saw that, okay, you know, I've got to, you know, sometimes you don't know what you don't know. And I think that was part of the revelation that I came to. You know, I didn't know some of the things that I just didn't know. And does that excuse my behavior? Absolutely not. But what it did do as I became aware of the fact that I didn't know how I should have responded, you know, when, when she and I would start getting angry at each other and the voices start raising and the kids are there screaming and all of a sudden you just hear this loud tornado, this, you know, this horns blowing off in your head and you can't think and can't hear clearly. Um, you know, it, it's hard, you, you know, that's, that's a hard thing to understand and process. And so eventually it did get to a point where I could start thinking clearly. So I had to work on anger management skills. You, you know, I had to work on conflict resolution. You know, I had to work on, uh, forgiveness. So the, the steps of grief in this case is, you, you know, there's about seven stages and it's de not denial and shock. So a lot of times when we get about ready to see that our marriage is about to fail, you, you know, it's like, man, I can't believe this is happening. This can't be happening. You, you know, this not, not me, you, you know, not me. This can't be happening to me. So there's this denial. There's this shock. And all of a sudden, you know, here comes pain and guilt. You, you know, you feel the brunt of that, that train hitting your chest, you, you know, your heart shatters because your world is just shattered and you, you become very, you know, you feel the pain, but then there's a lot of guilt. What could I have done differently? Right. And then you kind of move into anger and bargaining. You, you know, you become very angry at the person. Well, but 
but you know what, baby? Here's what I'll do. I'll do anything you ask me to do just so long as we can stay together. Well, why do we say that? Because the, the, the idea of having to start over it is devastating. The weight of the idea or the notion of having to start my life all over again is, is incredible. And so we'll do anything, right, to avoid that. So part of that doing anything is sitting there saying, baby, I'll do anything to save this relationship. But in, rea- in reality, that's just part of the stages of grief. And then you kind of get into depression, reflection, and loneliness. You know, you get you realize, okay, this thing is about over with. You, you know, there's nothing I can do to resolve. There's nothing I can do to save it. So as a result, you, you know, you don't want to go nowhere. You don't want to do anything. You start reflecting on everything. You start thinking back on all the things I could have done differently. And, and really, in reality, there's really nothing you could have done differently because you did exactly what you thought you were supposed to do in that moment of time. That's if you believe the philosophy that there is no wrong answer or there's really nothing wrong. And we do what we do. You are where you are perfectly in that moment of time. Right. Then you kind of start to realize, OK, you know what? Life has to go on somewhere. You know, I have to do something. I can't stay in this. And you start to move. You know, you, you may not know exactly where you're moving, but you start to move in some direction to get away from that hurt and that depression and that anger and that pain and that guilt. And you start looking at your life and say, okay, where do I go from here? You, you know, this marriage is over. This relationship is over. Uh, this person is past. There's nothing I can do. There's nothing I can bring, you know, do to bring um, the relationship to mend the relationship. There's nothing I can do to bring this person back in my life. What do I do? I got to rebuild. I got to reconstruct. I got to start all over again. And then you start accepting the fact that, okay, it's over. It's a done deal. It's the done data. It's, it, it, I said, it. it's over. And, and, you know, but there's, there's, there's a hope, um, you know, to bring that person, you, you know, there is hope to start all over. So I'm going to go to a quick commercial break, but I just wanted to offer those little tidbits to you to help you kind of maybe understand and process what the seven stages of grief is. So hold tight. I'll be back in about two minutes with my guest, Dr. Callie Estes. And she's going to, she's going to be good. So hold tight. Peace. Being a man in our society today comes with social expectations. Ivan Hunt is a certified professional life coach, specializing in working with those who defy those social expectations by recreating their lives to have meaning. If you are that person, schedule your free consultation at www.ivanhunt.com or by email at coach at ivanhunt.com. Hi, have you heard of Ivan Hunt? He is a passionate keynote speaker that motivates, inspires, and speaks from the heart. His corporate and military experiences makes him a good fit for any company, organization, or club. For more information, visit www.ivanhunt.com or email at coach at ivanhunt.com. It's me again, your man Ivan Hunt. You're back to the uh, talk radio show called Keep It Moving, coming live from Miami, Florida, but we're blasting worldwide on the CTR network. My guest this week is Dr. Callie Estes. Dr. Callie Estes is a highly sought-after celebrity addiction therapist, life coach, recovery coach, and wellness guru that blends talk therapy with forward and positive change to assist her clients in unlocking their true potential. She has been featured in books, magazines, radio, and television for her work in the addictions and therapy fields. She works with individuals, drug and alcohol treatment teams, and addiction professionals looking to advance their knowledge base. 
She has over 20 years experience working with drug, alcohol, and food addictions. Her deep understanding of drug and alcohol addiction, including the behaviors and ramifications that are associated with it, place her at the top in the field of addiction therapy. Dr. Callie Estes, how are you doing this morning? Good. How are you? I'm excited to be here. Good. I'm well. I'm well. And and first off, before we get started, I just want to say thank you, Dr. Estes, because I've had the honor of being, she has a podcast as well, and I'm sure she'll bring that up. <laughs> and, and, you know, I've had the honor to be on her show as well. So uh, I'm, I'm very grateful for her because she was one of the first people that actually had me on her show. So I was really, you know, honored by her. So Dr. Estes, I have, I have, I have a history of substance abuse. So today's show is, you know, I'm going to be very transparent in my own life. So, so if that's okay with you, how does that work? That works for me. And I did not know that. So this yes, will be interesting. Yes, yes. Yeah. Oh yeah. I bet it will. <laughs> um, so, so tell me, what, what, tell me more about yourself. Let the listeners know a little bit more about who you are and then we'll jump in. Sure. So I'm known as the celebrity addictions coach. I work with actors, actresses, musicians, CEOs, and I see them at their worst. So you go on TV, you see Kim Kardashian, you go, oh my God, she's beautiful and she's amazing. I get those types of people when they're throwing up in the toilet and I'm holding their hair. That's what I do. And I've been doing that for about 25 years. Um, I also have a company to train people. We're the largest right now in the world. We're in 22 countries and five languages. 40 classes, 20 teachers, and we teach people to be recovery coaches or counselors or interventionists. We're virtual classroom and live classroom setting, and I just put a book out called I Married a Junkie. So that's a little bit about me in a nutshell. <laughs> I, I like the name of the book, I Married a Junkie. You know, <laughs> my, my, my wife, you know, she might have agreed with that statement, you know, several years ago, because I think that's exactly what happened. I think she married a junkie, and, you know, I think she was in denial about it. And I think I was still in denial about it. You know, what do you find, you know, with the spouse who has married a junkie? What what are, what are some of the challenges that those spouses uh, face? Well, what happened with our story that's kind of unique is that I'm a professional in the addiction industry. And when I met my husband, he was in recovery. Uh, cocaine was his thing. So it wasn't out of control. It wasn't a problem. We were together about four or five years, and he started using heroin. And I never saw it coming because that wasn't his drug of choice. He's an uppers guy, not a downers guy. And alcohol was never a problem. Marijuana was never an issue. And it just blindsided me. So I didn't see that. I didn't know what to look for. And then it was he was always sick. He had the flu. He didn't feel like going out. And then things started getting missing from the house. He didn't want to play music. And then then he overdosed. And that's when... I kind of knew something was wrong. He got our BMW stolen and he overdosed and it was a mess. He was in Liberty City. It's like, what are you doing over here? And that's what it dawned on me. I'm like, he's using, he's using opiates. And for the spouse, sometimes you don't know what to look for because you're so in it and we get opposite schedules. I mean, I get up at 10 o'clock in the morning and I see clients till about midnight. He's up at Mm -hmm. five. He goes to the gym and he's in bed by eight. So him going to bed at 8 o'clock was never an issue because he always did that. And he was able to use underneath my nose. So Mm -hmm. as a spouse, sometimes it's hard to see the signs. And then on top of it, you don't want to admit that your loved one is manipulating you. You don't want to admit that. The person that's supposed to support and love you is lying to you and stealing from you. Right. And, and, you know, I I, kind of... And I, I, I was vaguely open about it in the early stages of, of my courtship with my wife. She knew about it. Um, I, I would do it, but kind of in it, it kind of indiscreetly, kind of sort of as a, this is me, accept me for who I am type deal. Did you encounter that as, as the more you became aware of it? Did you encounter that as well? I had that when we first met because he said he was transparent when we first met and he didn't tell anybody. He told me when he would go on dates and we met in our thirties, you have to keep that in mind. He would keep his past a secret because a lot of women didn't want to know. He's got 24 felonies and 14 misdemeanors from his drug use in his from 16 to 30. So he's embarrassed by that. And when I met him, he would, he was in recovery. So he wouldn't tell anybody, 
But one of the texts he sent me, and this is way back before Facebook was ever, you know, created. It was old school texting from the flip phone. He texted me something, and I used to work in the prison system. And when he texted me, I knew instantly he was an inmate, and I hit him with it. I said, "You did time, and you did federal time." And he responded back with, "Fine, I'll tell you." And he told me everything, and I said, "Okay." And it didn't bother me. So I had full disclosure before we started dating, and I knew. Because of what I do, it's always a possibility of relapse. It's always a possibility it's out of control. It's always a possibility of death. I could be a widow. It's absolutely possibility. I knew that, but I didn't expect it to be heroin. I thought if he dies, it's going to be a heart attack from cocaine. It's going to be, you know, he's not going to die of a fentanyl overdose in Liberty City. That's not going to happen. And when that happened, it was like, you know, oh my God, like this is not what I expected. And of course, I'm asking, and he's like, "No, no, no, no! I just got the car jacked." And the whole story was so strange because he had called me about six hours after the car got jacked. So the, the car has low jack, but you've got to do it quickly because they could disable it. So the first thing I said is, "I'm calling the police," and he didn't want me to. And as soon as he said no, I said, "Where are you?" He wouldn't tell me where he was, and I said, "I'm just going to come pick you up." And I get there, he's got his cell phone but no wallet. That made no sense to me. Who gets out of their car with their cell phone, not their wallet? He had no shoes on. The shoes were in the car, and it didn't make any sense. And I looked at him and I and I and I said, "None of this makes any sense." And you're all sweaty. Why are you sweaty? And he wouldn't give me any answers. And I kept saying to myself, "Something's wrong." And I didn't know until about a week later when the doctor bill came and the hospital bill came. And I said, "You were in the ER." No, no, no. Someone. And this is the story he told me. And this is how I blew it off the lid. He said. Somebody took my social security number off the registration to the BMW, and I said, first of all, your social is not on the registration, and it's registered to me, not you. They would have taken my information, not yours. And he had nowhere to go with that. He just stood there, and I'm like, what drug are you taking? What were you doing in the ER? And that's when he finally said, I overdosed on fentanyl. And I just was like, what? How long have you been using? Because you don't just use fentanyl; you upgrade to fentanyl. And I said, "How long have you been using?" And he looked at me, and he's like, "About a year and a half." And that's when he started to give me glimpses. But he, of course, didn't give me the whole story. I got a little of this and a little of that, and I'm piecing it together. And I'm like the worst PI you've ever met. You know, I'm running around the house looking for clues, and I'll figure it out because it's what I do. And yeah. as all this is going on, he has a second overdose. You know, and now it's like, what do you do? And we have a house in Colorado, so I'm like, we're going to Colorado. You're going to detox in Colorado. I can at least get you weed, and I can detox you on Suboxone and weed out there, and that's what we did, and it didn't work. <laughs> so it's like knowing what works and knowing how to do it and implementing it, and it's still failing. So as a spouse, it's like, wow, you know, what do I do? And I've got access to some of the top professionals in the industry. I'm calling everybody in, and it's still failing. But but you, you know what? You made an interesting statement. Before you even got to that, right? So you knew that mm-hmm. there was drug use. You knew what his drug of choice was, right? It, it's just yeah. like it's just like my, my wife knew my drug of choice too, you know. Mm-hmm. And but you, it sounds almost like you rationalized it, like it was okay that it was permissible. No, I see, I do, that. I do harm reduction. So for me. If you're going to use and this explain to you my mythology, I work with clients that aren't 100 abstinent. They are using something, but not to excess, and usually not their drug of choice. So when I met him, he said, "I'm a, an occasional cocaine user. Um, it doesn't get out of hand. It's not going to bankrupt us. It's here and there, and it was here and there, and it wasn't a big deal. That didn't bother me. The alcohol was never a problem. We'd go out, he'd have a, a glass of wine, two beers, not an issue. It never impacted us financially, emotionally, sexually. There was never an issue." So that's always been my take on addiction. If it doesn't affect us, or affect the family unit, or affect your job, then okay. If it's affecting those areas of your life, now you have a problem. He never did that with cocaine or alcohol or anything. He never caused a ruckus. That didn't happen until heroin, and then it was constant money missing, stuff missing from the house, him not home when he's supposed to be, him nodding out, him not going to functions. That's when it became a problem. And that's when I said, "We got to address this, and we got to figure this out." And, and that, now that's an interesting perspective too, because I got promoted using drugs. 
Mm-hmm. <laughs> I, I, I don't, you know, I, I think it, for, for me personally, I think it had a lot to do with because it kept me what I thought or what I considered to be in balance. You, you know, I was balanced. Mm-hmm. You know, the drug, you know, the drug allowed me to kind of just, you know, kill the noise, so to speak. But it was still every chance I could, I would do it. You, you know, is, is that a functional addict or is that no. still a recreational user? Okay, so that's where it gets different. So if you need it to survive, if I said to you, you're going to go four weeks without this drug and I want you to go to work and be just as productive and you tell me you can't, you have a problem. But if you could but say to me. You, I wouldn't have told you that I couldn't. I, 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 I think mentally I would have been strong enough to say, okay, I've got to go four weeks. But mm-hmm. on that fifth week, but on that fifth week, once that time is done, I'm going to go get, you know, I'm going to go get blasted. <laughs> okay. So that's what we have to take a look at is, is it impacting your life negatively on any level? If, if it's, you have to do it to excess, that's a problem because I have clients, this is going to sound strange because it's addiction. I have clients right. that can get up, do one line of cocaine and right. not touch it for a week. That's not a problem. I have clients that can get up and they do a gram of cocaine today and a gram tomorrow and they're up straight for three days and they're ordering escorts and their life's a mess. So it's right. two different types of clients. And I work okay. with each person on each level. And then I have clients that come to me and say, I don't want to quit totally, but I want to be more functional. I can't function on this thing or I can't function on that. Or right. I'm willing to give up cocaine, but I'd like to have a glass of wine with dinner. And I say, let's see if you can do it. Let's put the game in play. See if that's something you can do. Now, if you can't do it, if you can't go without that drug or you can't go without obsessing over that thing, and it can be anything. It could be porn. It could be escorts. It could be gambling. Right now, Internet, social media addiction is through the roof. Whatever it is, then we have to address that as a problem. But you have to have a, a life of balance. So what I do is I put the life back in balance. But that's an interesting. I don't think I've ever heard of somebody saying, okay, go ahead and do it. You know, you got an issue of some sort. But go ahead and let's just see if you can manage it. I mean, that's almost like, you know, <laughs> I guess, it, it, it's almost counterintuitive, right? It's almost reverse psychology. It is. And here's what happens. Remember, I get the clients that have tried 12 step and can't be abstinent. I get the clients that come to me and say, I've been to treatment two, three, four times. This is not working. And I say, what do you want to do? And they tell me, and I say, let's try that first. And the reason I do that is I want them to see if they can do what they're telling themselves they can. Can you truly get up and exist without this? Is it possible? So, for example, I have a client that's got a wife and a girlfriend, and he thinks he can manage both. And I said, do they know about each other? He says, of course not. And I said, this is going to end in disaster. He goes, oh, no, it's not. I'm like, okay, well, you can try it. So fast forward four weeks later, he calls me and says, this isn't working. And I said, you know, I knew this four weeks ago. Okay, so what do you need to change? He's like, I need to get rid of the girlfriend. I'm like, okay. So the difference is he came to the realization himself that he needs to get rid of the girlfriend. Every therapist that he's gone to told him, get rid of the girlfriend, get rid of the girlfriend. But it's a therapist telling him, this is what you need to do. Addicts don't want to be told what to do. When he came to me, I said, if it's working, roll with it. When it's not working, cut her loose. So now it's not working. Now it's a problem. But he so, so, made so, that decision. It's, so, so in other words, it, it's chess, not checkers from your perspective. So you already know based on experience, right? Just, you know, the history of working with all these types of, you know, addictive type of clients that the end result is more times than not, they're not going to be able to handle the very mm-hmm. thing that they're telling you that they're going to handle. So you just kind of let them go and find out on their own accord so they can have that epiphany for themselves. Exactly. Because we force addicts to get sober and addicts don't like to be told what to do. My right. husband's tagline is you're not the boss of me. And he's right. I'm not. I can't control human behavior. I can't stop you from using drugs. I can't stop you from overdosing. And I sure as hell can't stop you from dying. But (laughs) when you're ready, and this is how he quit, he finally, and I'll tell you exactly what happened. He has a friend 
the person that saved his life is in Liberty City. His name's he goes by the nickname Legs. And okay. my husband should never have been in Liberty City. You got a blonde haired white guy driving a BMW yeah. in Liberty City. Yeah. It's, it's a no no. <laughs> And yeah, he went I'm to see his, I'm yeah, Miami, so you, so I know exactly what you're talking about. Yeah. <laughs> right. So legs is this old school. He's, he's really, really cool. I'd love for you to meet him. He's okay. late sixties. He used to be uh, a jewelry heister back in the seventies in Miami. And he used right. to be a heroin dealer and he's a friend yeah. of my husband. He actually saved his life. When my husband nodded out, he called nine one one. This is the second overdose. And legs is such a unique character. And he really, you know, he called my husband one day and he said, I need to tell you something. And he was talking about all the overdose and fen- in defense and all Liberty City. So every time someone died, he would call and say, oh, we lost so-and-so. We lost so-and-so. And it got to the point where he would call three or four times a day. And my husband looked at me and he says, I'm really going to die on this stuff. I said, you're buying the same stuff these people are dying from, from the same city they're buying it from. Right. Then his dealer overdosed. And that's when he stopped and went. This guy overdosed on his own supply that he's selling me. And he right. sat there and he's like, he, he started thinking about it. But the turning point was when Legs called him and put, put, he went, um, Facebook, not Facebook live, uh, FaceTime with him. Uh-huh. And he had a friend over and his friend had all his belongings on his front porch and he's crying. He's the same age as my husband. He's in his late forties. And Legs said to my husband, his wife threw him out because he won't work. He won't you know, bring an income in. He's stealing from his wife. He's selling the things she buys. And she finally had enough and they've been together 30 years. And now he's on my front porch. And then Legs went over and he goes, you see this section over here that's blank? That's for you. Because your wife, and I know Callie, is going to toss you out and this is where you're going to live. That's what got him to quit. As strange as that was, it wasn't me. It wasn't a therapist because he had a therapist. He had a coach. He had a detox doctor. None of us got through his friend finally saying to him, look at this in real time. This is what's going to happen to you. And that's when he said, I'm done. I'm done. It, 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 I, I, there's, man, I can go in so many directions here. You, you know, it, it's something, and, and I, I, I was very resentful towards my wife when she put the brakes on me. And what I felt was an ultimatum, right? It, it's either you quit or we're done. That's how I interpret it. Now, you know, it may be something totally different than that, right? But that was how I interpreted it. And Mm -hmm. I was very, very angry with her. And it took me a long time to really kind of, you know, let it go in a way. And, man, uh, I kind of lost my train of thought there for a second. Sorry. No, that's okay. I'm going to piggyback off of that because that is correct. My husband hated me. He called me every name in the book. He said, how dare you? You know, I'm not your client. I'm not your patient. Don't you therapize me. What's wrong with you? You're bad at your job. You can't even get me sober. Oh, yeah. He told me everything. And the unique yeah. thing about me, and, and you don't know this about me, but this is this is in my book. My father used to call me stupid and fat and ugly for years. So when my husband did it, it didn't affect me. And he expected me to cave and be like, okay, you know, I need you. And I said to him one day, I don't need you. I don't need you financially. I don't need you emotionally. And I'm a girl in Miami. Honey, I can go out and get any guy I want tomorrow morning. And I said that to him. And he finally realized, I don't. He's not being productive. And I would always say, what are you doing? What are you doing to advance us as a family? Nothing. You're taking, you're not giving. Now you're a liability, not an asset. And That's what I kept saying for about six months. And when Legs said it to him, you're a liability. He said, Kelly doesn't need you. These women don't need you. I'm sure someone said this to your wife. You don't need this, right? This is a headache. And she said it to you. Go ahead. Well, and and, and I thank you because you brought me right back to that point. You you know, one of the crazy things that happened to me, and this was a revelation too, was my best friend at the time, right? Because I really did, you know, after my divorce and everything, I didn't, I didn't have family here. I don't have, you know, didn't really have a lot of friends here, but my drug dealer was my best friend, right? Because that was the one person who would always answer the phone whenever I called. And, and, and I actually thought for a while, there's a song out, you know, you know, so along those lines, I actually thought he was a friend. And then one day it dawned on me, man, he don't give a damn if I live or die. 
You, you know, all he wants is my money. And I did something really crazy. I told him, I said, man, if you ever see me again, I'm calling, you know, if I ever see you or if, I, or if you see me, I'm calling the police. And the only reason why I did that, because I knew I could never go back to that spot again. I, I, I knew it. So it was almost like I set myself up for danger in order to kind of protect myself. Um, I, I work at the Veterans Treatment Court on Wednesdays, and a lot of them have drug, you know, drug addiction problems. What is the common thread that you found amongst your clients that is the source or the cause of addiction? Oh, okay. So I have a different type of clientele. I'm not getting the severely mentally ill. I'm not getting mental health. I'm getting most of my clients have a low serotonin, dopamine. What is that? Explain that. Okay. The serotonin is the happy chemical. And in their brain, they have a low serotonin norepinephrine combination. This is Dr. Ken Blum's research. If you want to Google him, I love this stuff. So I get the guys that are, and most of my clients are men. Most of them are narcissistic, self-absorbed, high, high, high functioning individuals who make a lot of money, who are public profile. People like them. So (laughs) their thing is. No, I'm just uh, thinking that like, like, damn, are you talking about me? What? Go ahead. (laughs) So (laughs) people gravitate towards them. They're used to the spotlight. They're used to being doted on. People give them things. So they have this, they're, you know, entitled, they're narcissistic, they're high functioning, and they like adrenaline rushes. These are the guys jumping out of a plane, doing 150 miles an hour up 95, hire an escort in the middle of the day to see if they get caught. These are those guys. Now. I hear you. I hear you. (laughs) Okay. So traditional therapy doesn't work because in their brain, they have low serotonin. So I use supplementation with them. I use a product called GABA. Would not gabapentin, GABA, because that's what's missing in their brain. I do a lot of biotesting with them, and I take a look at what they're missing in their bloodstream and give them those nutrients. Because what I'm seeing is it's never enough. It's ne- It has to be bigger, better, faster, harder to get them to feel that rush. And that's because in their brain, they're missing the serotonin component. And I get that because my drug of choice was speed. I'm an uppers girl. I hate to go down. I'm not. I don't like my alcohol. I don't, you know, I don't want to sit and drool all over myself. I want to be cleaning the house, running around, doing 100 things, 100 miles an hour. So I yeah. get that. That's mm-hmm. the kind of clientele I get, and that's the direction I go. Um, I don't get a lot of depression. I don't get a lot of bipolar borderline because that's not my specialty. My specialty okay. truly is the narcissistic, self-absorbed, and I don't know if I can curse on your podcast, but the jerk. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. The narcissistic, self-absorbed asshole is my client. To a T. Okay. And they okay. come in my office. I'll give you an example. I had a gentleman show up and I'm in Miami. He pulls up in his Aston Martin and he's got on his, you know, $5,000 suit. And he gets out and he degrades the valet guy. My first meeting right. with him. So my first instinct to look at him was I said, what is that? A Bentley? And he goes, a Bentley? That's an Aston Martin. I said, Aston Martin looks like a cheap Corvette. You could have gotten something better. First meeting with him. And he looked at me and he just stood there. Yeah, like who the hell are you? <laughs> Fast forward, he's been with me for five years. I'm the only person he'll work with. Why? Because I gave him that challenge immediately. I didn't cave in to who he is, what he is, or how much money he has. And right. now I've taught him to treat the janitor and the CEO with the same respect. That's right. the kind of guy I get. I get the person who thinks they're awesome. And then I always say, you know, they always say there's nothing wrong with me. And I always say, well, if you're working with me, there's something wrong with you. Because clearly, you know, you called me for a reason. And right. usually it's because they've got every area of their life on lock except for the addiction. It's rampant. And it's rampant because their life really isn't as awesome as they say it is. So we look at every area of your life, your job, your relationships, your addiction problems, your brain health, working out, nutrition. I do all of that with them. So it's not just talk therapy. It's you have to change all these quadrants of your life. And you said your drug dealer was your friend. Nine times out of ten, they tell me that. And I have an exercise yeah. called um, Circle of Influence. And they always put right. their drug dealer right in that tiny little circle. And I always say, who is that? And they'll say, oh, that's Bobby, my friend. Well, what does Bobby right. do? Well, Bobby's my dealer. Your dealer is right. a business transaction. They're not your friend. And I always right. say, do you go to the movies with your with your dealer? Well, no. Do you go shopping with your dealer? Well, no. Oh, you hang out at his house for hours and have a beer and a cookout? No. Then he's not your friend. It's a business transaction. 
Stop paying him. Watch how quickly he did. He, he doesn't come around. Yeah. So and, and, those and, are conversations. So, so uh, you know, a lot of the characteristics that you described, you know, touch home with me. You know, mm-hmm. I, you know, my, my sister's called me a narcissist. You know, and the first time she called me that, it pissed me off because I didn't know what the word meant. <laughs> so I had to go, <laughs> you know, so I had to go look it up. But I, I, I'm that kind of, and I'm not the type of guy that's going to jump out of the plane. But I am the guy that's doing 150 miles an hour down 95. Um, mm-hmm. You know, I, you know, when I did, you know, I would always push it. I would always up the ante each time that I would use. I would always do a little bit more, do a little bit harder, do a little bit more reckless. Um, how, how, and, and truth be told, there's not a day that goes by, right, that I don't think about it. Is that normal or is that abnormal? That's normal because that's a behavior and a feeling you enjoy. It makes you feel good. And we like things that make us feel good. And that's the serotonin I'm talking about. Serotonin makes you feel good. So what I do with my clients, there's different types of music that will ping your brain the same as drugs. And they say, what? Music, gambling, sex, all ping your brain a certain way. So does mm-hmm. sugar. So if you're, if you're a cocaine addict and you do sugar, sugar pings the brain the same as cocaine. Now you don't get the euphoria from co- cocaine, but you get the same brain ping. The detox off of sugar is the same as the detox off heroin. Not as extreme, but it's the exact same thing. If you look at the chemical makeup, sugar is one chemical compound off of heroin. So can, can I ask, can I ask a question right there then? So, uh-huh. so is, so, so, so let's say somebody who has a, a sweet tooth. Mm-hmm. Are they, are, is that along the same lines? Is that somebody who has uh, the, the the makeup of being, uh, you know, an addict or yes, you, you know, if you're, oh, yes. if you're coming off because I got a sweet tooth for days. I you know uh-huh. if I, before I go to bed, there has you know I, I crave it. I crave having just something sweet before I go to bed. So, so it's a correlation to that then. Is that what you're saying? It, it is. So if somebody tells me they reach for sweets, the first thing I ask them is when during the day do you reach for sweets? And if they tell me first thing in the morning, it's generally a heroin or an alcoholic. Okay. Almost, almost instantly because heroin addicts crave sugar 24 seven. Alcoholics, as soon as they get sober, crave sugar. With cocaine okay. guys, I find it late at night, they're eating carbs and sugar. So if they tell me, like every night before bed, my husband likes cereal. And I told him, you can't have cereal. You, can't, every, you cannot have it. And it's not a bowl of cereal. He gets out the big mixing bowl that you make cookies in. And, put, and I'm like, no, we're not having this. You're going to get fat. And he just looks at me. He's like, I'm never going to get fat. I'm like, you know, you narcissism. Yes, you are. You cannot have this. So that's usually an indicator. So I ask people that. And I say, before bed, instead of having sweet, what I want you to do, is go get a, a bullet, a neutral bullet or a ninja and get a bunch of fruit and some protein. And you could put a little bit of milk in there if you want it. And I want you to make yourself a protein shake with fruit. The fruit will give you the sugar. The protein will give you the balance. You'll get a better night's sleep. And they look at me like I'm crazy. They're like, you want me to replace my candy, my cake, my cereal with a protein shake? And I say yes. Or a protein bar. Something that, that is more balanced because that spike of sugar is going to mess with your sleep and you're going to wake up and your cortisol is going to spike and come back and you're going to feel horrible when you wake up in the morning. So I try to work with them that way. So they're understanding what they're craving is fulfilling a need. Sugar is like cocaine. It fulfills the need of the brain ping and you're craving that ping. And then what you say is, well, at least I'm not doing coke. It's only sugar. Well, sugar is just, if not more addictive than cocaine. All my clients come off sugar and they think I'm crazy. So when they work with me, that's the first thing I tell them is we're going to detox off of sugar. It's going to be the hardest detox you've ever had in your life. And they're like, you're kidding. I could do this. Within 12 hours, they're calling me, telling me they hate me. It's like clockwork because the body's in withdrawal. The body wants that sugar, needs that sugar. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But I And and I have to keep. I have to keep sweets and cakes and stuff. I, I, so I, obviously I'm telling, you know, spilling the beans on what it is I like <laughs> to do, right? <laughs> um, but, you know, so you mentioned something earlier about mood disorders. So I was diagnosed 
you know, during the same time. So initially when I went to go get help, you know, I went to see a psychiatrist and I went, you know, specifically for the addiction. Right. And mm-hmm. I, I was so, I was so wound up that it took her probably close to four or five months before she could get me calm enough before she could even start working with me. And, and it wasn't until probably maybe a year, almost a year after that, that she finally said, okay, you, you know, ADHD, your bipolar borderline personality disorder. And, you know, that kind of helped me slow my mind down enough because I understood, you know, at least it put a label on something that I could uh, relate to or connect to or study on and research about. But, but, that's, but yet still, there's still how, and I know where I'm going with this. Yet still, there's still that day to day thought of it. How do you coach your client then around the guilt of still of still having that thought? Okay, so the first thing I do is thoughts are thoughts. You're going to have thoughts all day long about getting high or wanting to get high or wanting to escape. That's just how our brain is wired. Any situation that you're in where you have an uncomfortable feeling, your gut instinct is going to be, God, I just want to get high, or I just want a cake, or I just want to shop. Whatever it is, it's an escape. That's normal. Right. So that's the first thing. The second thing I do, and this is a little controversial, I don't like labels to so the bipolar, borderline, right. all this stuff. The first thing I tell them is I'm going to change your diet and your exercise. And six months later, I'm going to have you reevaluated for that diagnosis. And about 80% of my clients don't qualify for that diagnosis. And here's why. Certain foods mimic bipolar. If you're doing sugar, there's a crash on sugar. So let's say you eat a cake. And two hours later, you take the bipolar test. You're going to pop for bipolar because your mood in fluctuations go up and down according to your glucose levels. Does that make sense? Yes, yes. I'm following. Okay. Okay. A borderline personality, that is a hard diagnosis. And a therapist should be working with you for six months to a year before they ever give you that diagnosis because that's a pretty hefty diagnosis. So I get them off of everything. And I get them exercising and working out. And then I send them back to be re-diagnosed because I want to see if it shifts. And I want to see if it's a completely different diagnosis. And right. almost always it is. Very few times have I had people who are truly mentally health problems. It's mostly the diet, the exercise, and the coping skills. People don't know how to handle stress. They don't know how to handle guilt and shame. They don't know how to handle rejection. There's so many things we don't know how to handle, so our instinct is to grab something to minimalize that feeling. Right. So... Right. My challenge to you, since I'm on your podcast and your listeners are listening, I'd like to see, Mm -hmm. Ivan, if you could go sugar-free for two weeks. Sugar-free for two weeks. What, beginning Uh in two weeks? Mm -hmm. (laughs) Beginning today. Go for two weeks, no sugar, and then tell me in two weeks how you feel. Okay, question. Let's define sugar. So that's (laughs) (laughs) so 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 you could already see my here comes. The yeah, negotiation. Yeah. Yes, yes, absolutely. Uh, so, so is that no soda, uh, no candy? Are you no drinking sweets, soda? No. Uh, yeah. If you're watching okay. me on Facebook Live, you'll see me drinking soda. And I oh, have about five my- cups of coffee with, with, with two or three teaspoons of sugar already this morning in each cup. Um, uh, I, I didn't eat breakfast, so I usually don't oh. eat breakfast. But I usually eat. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Here I, we go. I, I know. I'm very clear on who I am, right? And I eat Starburst. My wife just put up on Facebook and no Starburst. And it's like, oh, my God, you're kidding me. You, you know. No um, sugar. So, okay, here you go. No okay. white or sugar in the raw. So white sugar is sugar in the raw with bleach. So it's not only sugar, it's sugar full of chemicals. So no sugar. That means no soda. That means in your coffee, no sugar. You're going to have to do stevia. Splenda is half sugar, half chemicals. You don't want Splenda. So you're looking to go no white sugar, no sugar in the raw. You can have all the fruit you want. You can have all the honey you want. You can have all the stevia you want. 
and you can have all the true organic maple syrup you want. You can have all the agave nectar you want. You cannot have sugar because all the things I named, honey, agave nectar, and true maple syrup and stevia are natural products that have what we deem sugar in them. They're natural. White sugar or cane sugar is not good for you. First of all, it causes cancer. Second of all, it causes mood disorders. So okay. I want you to go completely clear. Here's what's going to happen. And tell your wife I'm sorry ahead of time. You're going to be a pain in her ass for the first four days. Trust me. You're going to be grumpy. You're going to be irritable. You're going to be tired. Your sleep is going to be all messed up. Uh-huh. You're going to crave everything sweet. And then you're going to negotiate. Well, I'll just have a little of this. I'll just have a tiny bit of that. You're going to go through the whole gamut. Okay. You're going to detox. Okay. And when okay. you do, you are going to uh-huh. feel like a million bucks two weeks from now. Okay. I guess I don't have much time to try to get mentally prepared for this either. <laughs> right here. <laughs> but you know what? You know what, Doctor? Uh, I always want to call Doctor Callie. Uh, you know what, Doctor Estes? It, it, you know, one thing I pride myself on is being transparent, right? And that's what this show is also all about. It's all about inspiring and motivating, right? So mm-hmm. t- today on this show, oh, one one question. Do you, you know the the Luigi's Ices? Yes. Does that count? Luigi, now I'm Italian. So Luigi's right. Icy I, I know, is... I, I know that's, that's So that's why I'm asking. Does that count? <laughs> I, it's sugar, water, and and just frozen. It's 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 crap. It's syrup. No, no, no. You cannot have Luigi's Icy. Now, what you can do, what you can do, if you like stuff like that, get an ice cube tray and fill okay. it up with fruit juice. Go get real fruit juice, not cocktail, not ocean spray cocktail nonsense. Go get... True organic cherry juice, true organic pineapple juice, and put that in an ice cube tray with a toothpick in each one. And when they freeze, you have a snack. And it's very sweet, and it tastes like ice cream. Uh, Here's another hack. Check this hack out. People like ice cream. I'm an ice cream junkie. My first drug of choice was food. I'm a sugar junkie. My second drug of choice was speed. So what I do, because I love ice cream, you take four frozen bananas, Freeze them after they get real ripe. Wait till they get like brown. Freeze them. Take four frozen bananas, throw them in your Nutribullet and a little bit of vanilla extract and a little bit of cream or milk or whatever, just a little and turn it on till it's real thick. It tastes just like banana pudding ice cream to a tea. Okay. I, Dr. Estes, I want to, I, I got like less than 60 seconds to wrap up the show. I want to thank you for being on the show. I've really, really enjoyed it. And yes, people in the keep it moving world, I do accept her challenge. <laughs> awesome. I'm so excited. <laughs> hey, this is Ivan Hunt, host of the keep it moving radio show. And I hope y'all really enjoyed this today's show. It was a real conversation. Uh, and that's what this is all about coming live from Miami, Florida, but we're blasted worldwide on the CTR network. You can find me at IvanHunt.com or you can email me at coach at IvanHunt.com. I want to thank Dr. Callie Estes for my guest, for being my guest today. Love y'all. Peace. Thank you. Thank you for listening to today's show. Always remember there ain't nothing on the ground but a frown. So lace up your shoes, pull up your pants, shoulders back and head up and keep it moving.